Hello and welcome to our first lecture of the English novel for the fourth year student of the College of Arts, Al Iraqi University. This lecture is a follow up to the previous um, lectures that we used to have in our college, but due to the uh, recent events that we are transforming everything to an online um, um, lecture mode. This lecture is going to uh, discuss chapter four of um, the novel of James Joyce, which is the portrait of the artist as a young man. So without further ado, let's get started. So in this lecture, we are going to give um, a summary of the chapter and then I will do an analysis of the chapter itself followed up by a few questions that I would recommend that you uh, look for the answers. And what I'm going to do at the end of the lecture as well, I'm going to post um, a quiz to determine uh, your knowledge about this chapter that will um, ease the way for the next chapter, which is the final one as well, which is for chapter five. As we have discussed in the previous lecture that Stephen committed one of the deadly sins, which is adultery, and that he feels remorse and regret um, to the action and the sin that he committed. So in this chapter, Stephen imposes a new system of religious discipline upon himself that transforms his life. He prays every morning before a holy image, yet his sense of triumph, which is the sin, is lessened by his uncertainty whether his prayers are enough to counteract the ill effect of his um, sins. He divided his daily schedule into parts that corresponds to particular spiritual functions. Stephen keeps rosary beads which means masbaha or sibha, in his trouser pocket so that he can touch them as he walks. And he divides each rosary into three parts devoted to the three theological virtues. Reading books of devotional literature, Stephen learns about the three aspects of the Holy Trinity, though he cannot understand this solemn mystery of the trinity he finds the mystery easier to accept than god's love for his soul a reference to this part can be found in the novel and i quote here each of the senses was brought under a rigorous discipline end quote by a little act of self-denial gradually however Stephen comes to accept the fact that God loves him and he begins to see the whole word as one vast expression of divine love. He is careful not to get carried away by, by his spiritual distinguished achievement and he pursues even the lowest devotion carefully. Stephen avoids making eye contact with women he tried his best to avoid any temptation that will remind him of the previous sins that he committed. Gradually, however, Stephen comes to accept the fact that God loves him and he begins to see the whole word as one vast expression of divine love. He is careful not to get carried away by his spiritual distinguished achievement and he pursues even the lowest devotion carefully. Despite his attempts at self-discipline, he is periodically tempted by sin and bothered by sudden fits of impatience. So, when his mother sneezes, Stephen comforts himself, however, with the knowledge that strong temptation proved that his fortress is holding tight against the devil's attacks. He asks himself whether he has corrected his life so he was doubting himself all the time and he was trying to um, come over the uh, self and inner conflict um, 
about the sins that he committed and he felt so high guilty about them and he was always blaming himself for the sins that he committed. Therefore, he was avoiding um, anything that would remind him of the sin he committed or um, he was also trying to get himself involved in things in order to forget what he has um, committed and um, in order to release himself or his soul from the burden uh, the burden of his um, sin. So in order to understand the situation that Stephen puts himself in, he begins to apply spiritual discipline to his own actions in contrast to his passive status as a member of the audience listening to Father Arnold's sermon and attempting to understand it academically. Long passages during the sermon make no mention of Stephen at all, as the focus is on hell itself. Here, however, we focus on Stephen's reaction, which is no longer passive. His withdrawal into himself is not only described in psychological terms, but in physical ones as well. As when he goes to his room, and I quote, to be alone with his soul, end quote, and applying the knowledge from the sermon, Stephen becomes the master of his spiritual fate because he knows everything about it. He knows all about the sin he committed. Even his dream of hell indicates a more active relationship with the torments he undergoes, or the tortures, al-adab, as the goat-like devil come from his own mind as his own creations. Since they are products of Stephen's own mind, he can disown them if he wishes, which means getting rid of them. Therefore, as scary as the goat nightmare is, it is something of a release and a relief for Stephen who runs to the window to be calmed down by the fresh air. His decision to confess his sins is the next step in his gradual process of taking control of his spiritual state. لذلك لكي يستطيع أن أن يتجاوز الأزمة النفسية التي يمر بها كان لزاما عليه أن يعترف بذنبه أمام أحد القساوسة. لكي يتخطى مرحلة العذاب التي يمر بها والكوابيس التي تراوده. However, Joyce suggests that a saint's life may not be desirable for Stephen. Joyce's style, which is richly detailed and concretely sensual in earlier sections of the novel, now becomes extremely dry, abstract, and academic. This style corresponds with Stephen's psychological state as Stephen becomes more ascetic and self-depriving. Joyce's language loses its colorful adjectives and complex syntax. The very difficulty of reading such dry language suggests the difficulty of the life that Stephen is leading. Stephen's question at the end of chapter 4, section 1, and I quote, I have amended my life, have I not? Question mark, end quote. It emphasizes the fact that Joyce himself has amended his uh, prose. Importantly, though Stephen explicitly acknowledges that his life has been changed, he does not say that it has necessarily improved. His heroic efforts to deprive himself are impressive, but do not necessarily make him a better person. Vocation has ended and Stephen is back to his Jesuit school, where he has been mysteriously summoned to a meeting with the director. Stephen goes to the director and listens to his ideal discussion about whether or not the Captain Priestley rope should be eliminated. The director laughingly refers to the rope as a dupe, meaning skirt in French. Stephen feels awkward. The dupe reference 
calls up thoughts of women's undergarment in Stephen's mind. وهذا الشيء كان يذكره بالذنب أو المعصية التي ارتكبها وكان يظن أن القس يشير إلى هذا الأمر بطريقة غير مباشرة. Stephen wonders why the director makes mention of skirts and it occurs to him that the priest may be testing Stephen's response to the mention of women. The director asks Stephen whether he has ever felt he has a vocation and urges him to consider a life in the church. The director says that the priesthood is the greatest honor, but he also adds that it's a very serious decision to make. At first, Stephen is intrigued by the thought of the priesthood and pictures himself in the admired, respected role of the silent and serious priest carrying out his duties. As he imagined the bland and ordered life awaiting him in the church, however, he uh, begins to feel a deep unrest burning inside him. He walks back home from school and passes a shrine to the Virgin Mary, but he feels surprisingly cold towards it. هذا الأمر كان كله نتيجة للشعور بالذنب الذي كان يراود ستيفن طوال فترة ارتكابه المعصية. When Stephen sees his disorderly house, he knows that his fate is to learn wisdom, not in the refugee of the church, but, I quote, among the snares of the word, end quote. Arriving home, he asks his brothers and sisters where their parents are. He learns that his parents are looking for yet another house because the family is about to be thrown out of its current one. Stephen reflects on how weary his siblings seem even before they have started on life's journey. Stephen impatiently waits for his father and tutor to return with news about the possibility of his admission into the university. Stephen's mother is hostile to the idea, but Stephen feels that a great fate is in store for him. He sets off walking towards the sea, encountering a group of teacher friars on the way. He considers greeting them, but concludes that it is impossible to imagine them being generous towards him. He recites snatches of poetry and regards the light on the water. Stephen comes upon several of his schoolmates who are swimming and they jokingly greet him as they say his name in Greek. Reflecting on the myth of Didalus that his name evokes, Stephen ponders his similarity to that fabulous artificer who constructed wings with which he flew out of imprisonment. Stephen is suddenly enraptured by this thought and feels that he will soon begin building a new soul that will allow him to rise above current miseries. At that moment, he sees a beautiful girl wading in the water, her skirts hiked up high. He and the girl make eye contact for a moment. Stephen perceives her as an angel of youth and beauty, and he swoons inwardly. In the evening, he climbs a hill and watches the moon. As the analysis of this part, although Stephen's path through life continues to be guided by females, the kinds of women who influence him change as he grows older. 
The Virgin Mary has been Stephen's main object of devotion, but now she seems to have lost her power over him. When he passes by a shrine to the Virgin on his way home from school, he glances at it, and I quote, coldly, no longer stirred by her presence. The school director's odd emphasis on the word dupe, meaning skirt, implies that some other women may have replaced Mary in Stephen's heart. Stephen's turn away from the church and towards the world is emphasized when he turns from the virgin to the beautiful girl he sees bathing. Importantly, his shift echoes directly after Stevens contemplates the Dallas use of art to achieve freedom. A suggestion that Stephen will do the same. The bathing girl is a secular version of the Virgin Mary, an emblem, which means um, a sign or uh, runs. Uh, of a means to rise to heaven but without the church so he saw her as a different way uh, towards heaven وهذا يعني انه اتخذها رمز جديد لايصاله لقمه السعاده التي يحلم بها الى الجنه التي يطمح لها شيء يغنيه عن الكنيسه او شيء بديل عن الكنيسه لطالما أشار جويس في رواياته إلى الأعمال الأدبية الكلاسيكية as seemingly insignificant comments or phrases يعني عبارات وإشارات في الروايات الأخرى كمسرحيات أو قصائد One of the primary sources on which Joyce draws in a portrait of the artist as a young man is a Greek myth. والتي هي الأساطير الإغريقية التي تمت الإشارة لها في الرواية كمثال على ذلك شخصية the Dallas. The mythic aspect of the novel emerges clearly in this section with the reference to the Dallas. In Greek mythology, the Dallas was a renowned craftsman who built a pair of wings for himself and a pair for his son in an attempt to escape imprisonment on the island of Crete. In this novel, Stephen's view of himself changes when his friends address him with a Greek version of his name. He suddenly begins to reflect on certain affinities between himself and that mythical, fabulous artificer no longer defines himself through Christian doctrine by relating himself to Christ and Mary. Rather, Stephen turns to pagan sources and inspirations in his quest for self-definition. His name is significant. His first name alludes to the first Christian martyr, Saint Stephen. His surname, however, alludes to a pagan character whose skill allows him to rise high above the world. لذلك هناك انقسام بين الاسمين. الاسم الأول اسم مسيحي ديني بينما الاسم الثاني هو إغريقي أو أسطوري. In this section, Stephen begins to shift his emphasis from his first name to the last name. He dwells on the idea of the Dallas flight giving winds, a piece of handicraft that symbolizes the individual's ability to create art and the possibility of transcending worldly troubles. Much as the Dallas escaping prison, Stephen dreams of escaping the misery of his impoverished family and narrow, sad life. To Stephen, the vision of his mythical namesake is not just a hint of his own fate, but a prophecy of it. لذلك لها أهمية هذه الميثولوجي لها أهمية في تقرير مصيره وتغيير حياته من ال من التدين إلى ال إلى الفن وهذه انتقالة قوية جدا ومهمة جدا في الرواية. 
It's also a prediction that cannot be avoided. Stephen's mental image of a hawk-like man flying sunward above the sea strikes him as a, and I quote, prophecy of the end. He had been born to serve and had been following through the mists of childhood and boyhood, end quote. The Dallas is a, and I quote, symbol of the artist forging anew in his workshop out of the sluggish matter of the earth, a new soaring, impalpable, imperishable being. End quote. This version is not simply an image of his future, but of his childhood and boyhood as well. His vision reveals a hidden thread that connected Stephen's past, present and future into one whole. Most important, perhaps, Stephen realizes that the art that he will forge is not merely a beautiful object, but an entire eternal existence. Through his art, Stephen creates an imperishable being, very much like a soul. He will not just create literature, but will create himself. لذلك هذه المرحلة هي مهمة جدا في حياة ستيفن كنقطة تحول في طريقة تفكيره وطريقة النظر إلى نفسه كفنان ختاما لهذه المحاضرة هناك نقاط مهمة قد ذكرت خلال الشرح هذا وهي الشعور بالذنب المتواصل لدى ستيفن طريقة النظر إلى المرأة وما تمثله وكيف اهتزت صورة مريم العذراء في داخل نفس وقل ستيفن الجزء الآخر هو الأسطورة الإغريقية التي تقسم اسم ستيفن إلى جزئين الجزء الأول الديني المسيحي والجزء الثاني الإغريقي الأسطوري والتناقض بين الاثنين وقد تكون ترابط في في بعض المراحل ولكنه في الحقيقة انتقالة كانت Therefore, the most important questions you need to think about at this stage um, is one, um, the image of women and its representation to Stephen. And the second um, thing that you need to focus on is the mythology, the Greek mythology. Uh, and what this stage represent to Stephen as the main important cores of this um, section and in addition to the repentance and the feel of guilt that Stephen felt along the way. This is the end of this lecture. Here are some important quotations that I hope will be useful to you to give you some important ideas about the novel. And I wish to see you in the next lecture. Take a good care. Goodbye.